So because the irreducible polynomials form the building blocks of all the polynomials whose roots we'll be interested in this semester, one of the biggest questions we have to be able to answer is, is a given polynomial irreducible, or can I factor it with rational coefficients? So we'll look at three different ways to decide on the irreducibility of a polynomial over the rationals. We're going to start with a toy example. p is 2t to the fourth minus 15t plus 12. It's not too hard to convince yourself that if this polynomial does have a rational root, then we must be able to factor out something, at least something of degree 1, t minus that rational root. And we have the rational roots theorem that can tell us whether or not a polynomial has a rational root or not. For this polynomial, we could try all the possible combinations of a divisor of 12 divided by a divisor of 2, and by exhausting all 16 of those possibilities just by plugging them into p and finding out that none of them equals 0 when we plug them into p, that this particular polynomial has no rational roots. So that's all well and good. This polynomial has failed the rational roots test. Therefore, it doesn't automatically factor with a term of degree 1 in it. But that's not enough. It's not enough just to know that there's no rational root to guarantee that a polynomial is irreducible. Just having no rational root might still mean that it factors in some other way. And of course, the prime example is something like t to the fourth minus 5t squared plus 6. Doesn't have a rational root, but a little inspection shows that we can factor it as a quadratic in t squared. And so it factors in a non-trivial way, even though it didn't have a rational root. So what are our options? What else can we do to decide whether a polynomial is, in fact, irreducible over the rationals? The first way is not so much a deciding technique as it is a simplifying technique, and it's called Gauss's lemma. The idea of Gauss's lemma is as follows. If there is no way to factor this polynomial over the integers, then Gauss's lemma will say that there's also no way to factor it over the rational numbers. So irreducibility over z implies irreducibility over q. The idea for why Gauss's lemma works is let's think about what the contrapositive might be. If I could somehow factor the polynomial p over the rationals, then each of those factors would be polynomials with rational coefficients, so p's over q's, r's over s's, where the p's, q's, r's, and s's are all integers. But in that situation, we can actually show that if we can factor it with these rational coefficients, then when we multiply it back out, it has to have integer coefficients, 2, negative 15, and 12 in this example. Um, and it turns out that we can show that that means it must have factored over the integers in the first place. So that's all well and good. It tells us that irreducibility over the rationals is guaranteed if we have irreducibility over the integers. So how do we use that? We use Gauss's lemma as a simplifying technique to be able to clear the denominators of a polynomial that has rational coefficients to turn it in to a polynomial with integer coefficients. So for example, if I want to know if this polynomial, 1 quarter t cubed minus 2 thirds t plus 1 fifth is irreducible over the rationals, it turns out I can answer that question merely by clearing all the denominators first, multiplying by 60 for example. And if that polynomial is irreducible over the integers, then the original polynomial q must have been irreducible over the rationals. So Gauss's lemma is our tool for clearing denominators and thinking about every polynomial over q instead as a polynomial over the integers. But that's still not enough to actually decide on irreducibility. So here comes the main result. This is the one that we're going to use the most to decide whether a polynomial is irreducible. And it's called Eisenstein's criterion. And Eisenstein's criterion works as follows. If we were somehow able to factor this polynomial p over the integers, then let's say we could factor it with a 2t squared and a 1t squared as some of its leading terms. Then we would have had to have gotten this 2t squared and 1t squared by looking at the factors of the leading coefficient 2. Likewise, with the constant terms in each of these factors, each of those constant terms has to be a factor of the number 12. So Eisenstein's criterion is a way of extracting divisibility properties out of the coefficients of p in order to decide whether or not it's possible to factor p. Let's look at another example that we could already answer in another way. A quadratic polynomial like t squared minus 6t plus 12. How come that doesn't factor over the integers using the divisibility properties of its coefficients? Let's suppose that it did factor into t minus a times t minus b. Then as any student of high school algebra can tell you, that must mean that the sum of a and b has to be equal to 6, and the product of a and b has to be equal to 12. The sum and product of the roots theorem would also guarantee that. But let's think about what that implies in terms of divisibility by looking at the prime factorizations of 6 and 12. 
and then observing that both the prime factorizations of 6 and 12 have a prime in common. They actually have a couple of primes in common. But for this discussion, let's focus on the prime 3. We can see that 3 divides the product of a and b, which is equal to 12, and 3 also divides the sum of a and b, which in this case is equal to 6. But 3 is a prime number. And prime numbers have the property that a prime number cannot divide a product unless it divides one of the factors of that product. So if 3 divides a times b, then 3 must divide 1 of a or b by itself. Without loss of generality, let's assume that 3 divides a. In other words, a here has to be a multiple of 3. But if a is a multiple of 3, then according to the second statement, because 3 divides a plus b, that must mean that b is also a multiple of 3. So in other words, in this example, it's not possible to, for 3 to be a factor of 1 of a or b. Because it divides both the sum and the product, it has to be a factor of both a and b. So both a and b are multiples of 3. But what does that mean about their product, a times b? It means that a times b would have to be a multiple of 3 squared, or 9. But in this example, a times b is equal to 12, and therefore that's absurd. It's not possible. So the divisibility criteria that we're going to need for Eisenstein's criterion are going to have something to do with whether or not the coefficients of this polynomial are divisible by a prime, but whether or not the constant at the end of that polynomial is divisible by the square of that prime. So here's Eisenstein's criterion in its generality. It says that if we can find a prime integer, q, such that, first of all, q is a factor of every one of the non-leading coefficients, in other words, everything but the leading coefficient, q has to be a factor of. But more than that, we also need q not to be a factor of the leading coefficient. If it were also a factor of the leading coefficient, we could just factor it out of everything, and it wouldn't be that interesting. So we want q to be a factor of every non-leading coefficient, but not a factor of the leading coefficient. And then one more observation, and this is the one that we saw in the example a moment ago. We also want q squared not to be a factor of the constant term of that polynomial, which in this case was 12. If we can find a single prime integer that does all of these three things for our polynomial, then Eisenstein's criterion will say that p is irreducible over q. This is actually a really, really powerful result. Let's see how it applies to our specific example. Looking at the prime factorizations of the coefficients, what we're looking for first is a prime which is a factor in every non-leading coefficient. And just looking at these prime trees, we can see that 3 is the prime candidate. So let's focus on the prime 3. It's a factor of every non-leading coefficient. Is it true that 3 is not a factor of the leading coefficient? Absolutely. There's no 3 that goes into 2, so our second criterion is satisfied. Finally, is 3 squared a factor of the constant? Absolutely not, because 3 only appears in its prime factorization once. So the prime 3 satisfies all three of these properties. Therefore, Eisenstein's criterion will guarantee for us that this polynomial is, in fact, irreducible over the rational numbers. So RP is what we call an Eisenstein polynomial with prime 3, and that makes it irreducible. So Eisenstein's criterion is incredibly powerful, and it's the one that you're going to use the most often in this course for proving the irreducibility of a polynomial over the rationals. But we have one more technique that we can use if a polynomial doesn't yield to any of these techniques. The technique of last, result is, last resort is something we're going to call reduction mod n. Here's the idea of how it works. Let's suppose that I have a polynomial like p t to the fourth minus 5 t squared plus 6 that we looked at before, that we happen to know factors over the integers. It's not irreducible. This one is t squared minus 2 times t squared minus 3. Well, what would happen if I took this polynomial and I reduced all of its coefficients modulo a certain integer, n, for example? So let's take this polynomial p, and let's reduce it, I don't know, mod 3, for example. That turns negative 5 into positive 1, it turns 6 into 0, and it turns in our factorization t squared minus 2 into t squared plus 1, and t squared minus 3 into t squared by itself. But the key observation is that because p factored over the integers, when we reduce everything mod 3, it still factors over the integers mod 3. Right? And it didn't matter that we picked 3 here. This would work for any z mod n. So if a polynomial factors over z, then it must also factor over z mod n. Well, how is that helpful? Well, look at the contrapositive of that statement. If a polynomial does not factor over z mod n, then it does not factor over the integers. 
And if it doesn't factor over the integers, then according to Gauss's lemma, it doesn't factor over the rational numbers either. So this is a powerful statement, that irreducibility over z mod n implies irreducibility over z, and therefore irreducibility over q by Gauss's lemma. So this gives us a technique we can use. Let's see how reduction mod n can actually help us to show that this polynomial, t to the fourth minus 15t plus 7, is in fact irreducible over the rationals. So our technique is going to be to reduce everything modulo n, and it would certainly make our lives easier if that reduction makes some of our terms vanish. So one idea might be to reduce everything mod 7 to make that constant term vanish. If I do that, I get t to the fourth plus 6t. Problem with that is that that polynomial actually factors. We can pull a t out of everything. And so the, it's proof of nothing, because irreducibility over z mod 7 would prove irreducibility over z, but reducibility over z mod 7 doesn't prove anything for us. We have a factorization over z mod 7. That doesn't tell us anything about whether we have a factorization over z. So what we'd like is we'd like terms to vanish, but we'd like the result to still be demonstrably irreducible over z mod n. So instead of choosing 7 for our modulus, we should try choosing something else. What happens if I decide to get rid of that middle term? Maybe by taking everything mod 5 instead of mod 7. When I reduce this polynomial mod 5, I get t to the fourth plus 2. That middle term goes away. So that certainly makes our life easier. But now we're faced with a question, is t to the fourth plus 2 irreducible over z mod 5? Does it factor? Now, if it did factor, because it's a degree 4 polynomial, there's really only two different ways that it can factor that's, that are non-trivial. One way is to multiply a polynomial of degree 1 by a polynomial of degree 3. Let's suppose we were able to do that. Then that polynomial of degree 1 is going to have a root, x, in z mod 5, which is going to be a root of the polynomial, p. In other words, if we can factor a term of degree 1 out of this polynomial, then there must be a root of this polynomial in z mod 5. Does p have a root in z mod 5? We can check that directly, just by looking at the values of t to the fourth plus 2 for all the different residues mod 5 and finding out that none of them are equal to 0. Therefore, this polynomial has no root in z mod 5. Therefore, we cannot factor it as something of degree 1 times something of degree 3. So that rules out that particular possibility. The question remains, though, if we can factor p in some different way. And the only other different way that there could be is to factor p as a product of something of degree 2 times something of degree 2. And because our leading term here is t to the fourth, the leading term of each of those factors had better be t squared, because we're trying to factor over the, uh, the integers mod 5 here. So, let's suppose this were possible. Then the remaining terms in here, at plus b, ct plus d, if we were to multiply this back out and equate the coefficients to t to the fourth plus 2, we would find out that, for example, b times d has to be equal to 2, equating the constant terms. ad plus bc equals 0, equating the terms of power 1. Uh, equating the co uh, quadratic terms would give us another relationship. Equating the cubic terms would give us another relationship. a plus c equals 0. And then we just have to go about the process of trying to reduce our numbers of variables. So if a is equal to the opposite of c, then according to that third equation, b plus d has to equal a squared. Now is when we use a fact about z mod 5. Namely, in z mod 5, what are the perfect squares? The only perfect squares in z mod 5 are 0, 1, and 4. You can check that just by squaring every element of z mod 5 and finding those are the only numbers that you can get. This observation is going to be important for us. If we use that same a equals minus c to reduce our second equation, it's going to tell us that a times d minus b is equal to 0. And since z mod 5 is a field, it has no zero divisors, this means that either a must be 0 or b must be equal to d. But if b were equal to d, that would make b times d equal 2, and 2 would have to be a perfect square. But that can't happen because the only perfect squares are 0, 1, or 4. So it's not possible for b to equal d. Therefore, since z mod 5 is a field, we must conclude a is equal to 0. But if a is equal to 0, then that also means c must be equal to 0 by that fourth equation. So now a and c have gone away. And that leaves us with only two equations. b times d is equal to 2, and b plus d is equal to 0. But if b plus d is 0, then b and d are opposites in z mod 5. And therefore, b times d has to be equal to minus b squared. So minus b squared is equal to 2. From whence we can find out, multiplying both sides by negative 1 in z mod 5, b squared has to equal 3. But again, that's impossible because the only perfect squares are 0, 1, and 4.
Therefore, a number theoretic divisibility argument has shown us that it's also not possible to factor t to the fourth plus 2 in z mod 5 into a product of a quadratic factor times a quadratic factor. Therefore, there is no possible way for this polynomial to factor in z mod 5. And according to reduction mod n, if it's irreducible over z mod 5, that makes it irreducible over z. And Gauss's lemma, therefore, makes this original polynomial irreducible over q. So those are three different methods that we can use in this course to justify why a polynomial that has no rational roots is irreducible over q. Gauss's lemma tells us we can clear out the denominators first and think of it as a polynomial over z. And then Eisenstein's criterion, the most important one, is going to let us use the divisibility properties of its coefficients to identify a prime which divides every non-leading coefficient and doesn't divide the leading coefficient, and its square does not divide the constant coefficient. That will prove irreducibility, according to Eisenstein's criterion. But if Eisenstein doesn't work, we can still try reduction modulo n, whereby if a polynomial is irreducible over z mod n, then it's irreducible over q.